All right, welcome back to another episode of Science with Serbeck. Today, what we're going to be talking about is limiting reactants and empirical formulas. Now, before we get into the details of notes, I just want to outline a few objectives that we should be able to uh, meet by the end of this video. Uh, so, number one, calculate the empirical formula of a compound having been uh, given the appropriate analytical data such as elemental percentage or the quantity of CO2 and H2O produced by combustion. Objective number two, calculate the molecular formula having been given the empirical formula and the molecular weight. Objective number three, calculate the mass of a particular substance produced or used in a chemical reaction. Objective number four, determining the limiting reagent or the limiting reactant in a reaction. And objective number five, calculate the theoretical and actual yields of a chemical reaction given appropriate data. So let's go ahead, let's start out here with limiting reactant. And uh, the limiting reactant really should just be uh, singular here, not plural. But it's defined as the reactant that is consumed completely during a chem chemical reaction. Now, the other reactant or reactants are not completely con consumed, or if they're not completely consumed, uh, they're considered to be those excess reactant or reactants. Now, I have some generalized steps to be able to determine what uh, the limiting reactant is in a chemical reaction. Uh, so I'll give you the generalized steps, and then we'll go into a specific problem. So the first step is to calculate the moles of both reactants. The second step is to pick a reactant and see how much of the other reactant is needed. Now I'm gonna leave step two a little bit broad, and this is because instead of just converting one reactant to the other reactant, we're gonna to convert to a product, and that's gonna help us out later on in this particular video when we have to talk about the theoretical and actual yield and make those calculations. So step two is kind of broad, uh, but step two, three is compare the amount of reactant present to the amount of that reactant selected. Again, step three is kind of broad, um, so we're gonna get more in depth and in detail in our particular example here. Uh, so it just gives you a, kind of a generalized guidelines. In our example problem, I'll show you how specifically it can be easily found to determine the uh, limiting reactant. So let's go ahead, we'll, we'll transition to a, a problem here. And it's our example of a limiting reactant. We want to know in the problem how many moles of NH3 ammonia can be formed from three moles of nitrogen N2 and six moles of hydrogen H2. Okay, so what I'm going to do, and it's a, it's a little bit different from the, the steps or the guidelines, but it makes it easier down the road. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start out with the first thing that is given, and that is three moles of N2. And so all we need to do is put down three moles of N2. Now, what we're going to do is this. And this is most of the time the case, but if you look here, it says, hey, how many moles of NH3 can be produced? So instead of doing that comparing business where we convert one reactant to the other reactant, we're just gonna convert the number of moles in this case of N2 to the number of moles in H3, because that ultimately becomes our answer. Now, to do this stoichiometry, remember, diagonal units always have to cancel out. So because we had moles of N2 on top, diagonal to the bottom right, we have moles of N2. Now, we can go from moles of one substance to moles of another if we go mole to mole. So this unit up here has to be moles and how stoichiometry work is it says, hey, mole to mole conversion, we can go from one substance to another and we can put NH3 there. Now, if you have mole over mole, the way we find our numbers to insert here is from our balanced chemical equation. So in front of N2, 
the coefficient in front of n2 is a 1. So we put a 1 associated with N2. Now in front of NH3, ammonia, is a 2 coefficient. So we put a 2 in front of our number of moles NH3 in our particular um, setup here. Now, what we do here is we multiply 3.0 times 2. So 3.0 times 2, we get 6 in our calculator. We divide it by everything on bottom. We divide it by 1, and so we obtain the value of 6.0 moles of NH3. Now, that's not our answer because we still have to worry about 6 moles of H2. Then we can do that comparison. So we're going to do a similar thing here. We're going to start out now with 6 moles of H2. So we have 6.0 moles of H2. We go through the same stoichiometric process here. In diagonal here, we are going to have moles of H2 on bottom. And on top, again, we're still trying to convert to moles of NH3. And we can go moles of one thing to moles of another substance. So we put moles of NH3 on top. Now again, when you have mole over mole, you look to the balanced chemical equation to find those stoichiometric coefficients. So in front of H2, there is a coefficient of 3. So that is the value we place there next to H2. Now in front of NH3, there is a stoichiometric coefficient of 2. So we go ahead and we calculate this out to see to see what our answer is. So we're going to take 6.0 times 2. So 6.0 times 2. Then we're going to divide it by everything on bottom, which it's just a 3. So we divide it by 3, and we get an answer of 4.0 moles, moles of NH3. Now our comparison comes into play. So the question, and I'm going to write this down here, is this. Between 6 and 4, which number is less? Well, between 6 and 4, the number that is smaller is 4. So whatever number is smaller becomes the amount of, in this case, NH3 that can be produced. So we're gonna have a couple of things here that I wanna write down as our final answer. Number one, number one, one of our answers here is that 4.0 moles of NH3 can be produced. Because that was ultimately, if you look back in the question, that was ultimately the question of this particular problem. It says, hey, how many moles of NH3 can produce? Well, now, whichever one of these starting reactants gave us this 4, which in this case was H2, this means that H2 in this particular problem is the limiting reactant. And we abbreviate, to save some time here, we abbreviate reactant as just LR. That saves you some time there. Now, what that means about N2, because it is not the limiting reactant, it is the excess reactant. So our, our other part of this answer here is that nitrogen, N2, is the excess reactant. And I like to abbreviate excess reactant as ER. Okay, so now we get the idea here of we need to convert our substance to a particular problem and we need to uh, uh, excuse me convert it to a, a similar product and compare those two answers and that allows us to see what is limiting and what is excess so now we'll transition here uh, to a limiting reactant problem where we're not just going simple mole to mole ratio we're going to go gram to gram ratio. So a little bit more complicated here. Uh, so we'll transition uh, to this particular problem right here. 
uh, gives us a little bit more of an idea of a, a real world um, stoichiometric problem. All right, so this problem, we have hydrogen reacting with oxygen to produce our water uh, vapor. Now, this is used to produce electricity in a hydrogen fuel cell, and we wanna know how many grams of water can form from a fuel cell that contains 150 grams of hydrogen, H2, and 1,500 grams of O2. Well, what we're going to do is this. We are going to start out with the first reactant that's given, and that is 150 grams, so 150 with a decimal that becomes important here, 150 grams of H2. Now, we're gonna set up our conversion factor, and remember, what we're trying to convert to here is that product that's listed in our problem. So in this case, it is water, so the first thing we're gonna to try to do is get to grams of water, but remember, we can't go grams of one substance to grams of another in one uh, swift step. We first have to go grams of H2 to moles of H2. So we're gonna have grams of H2 on bottom, and then we're gonna have moles of H2 on top. Now. Right here, gram over mole, or in this case, mole over gram, we have to turn to the um, value here for our uh, molar mass. And so one mole of H2 equals 2.02 grams of H2. So again, we're gonna insert 2.02 grams to every one mole. And then again, moles of H2 is not grams of water, so we have to do another conversion. So we're gonna get rid at this time of our moles of H2, and now we wanna to convert to H2O. So I'm gonna put that there, H2O, but we have to go moles of one substance to moles of another. So we're gonna put moles of H2O on top. Again, mole over mole, where we find this value here, or these numbers, is from our balanced chemical equation. So we see that we have a two in front of H2. So this becomes two. And then in front of H2O, we have a coefficient of two. So we have two here. And then again, we're still not in grams of water, so we have to do one more conversion. So this time, moles of H2O is gonna cancel. Now, because we're at moles of H2O, on top, we can have grams of H2O. Now to save you some time here, the molar mass of water, one mole of H2O equals 18.02 grams of H2O. So one mole of water and 18.02 grams, so we have 18.02 grams is our final conversion. So what we're going to do here in our calculator, or at least what I'm gonna do, is I'm gonna multiply everything on top. So in my calculator, I'm gonna have 150.0 here times one, times two, times 18.02. I'm gonna press enter on top. That is just the stuff, the calculations on the top. Now I have to divide by everything on bottom. And real key here is gonna be a set of parentheses. So I'm gonna take what's on bottom. So I have 2.02 times, and that's important, times two times one. And I'm gonna press enter. And I get a value of 1,038, which rounding to three significant digits would get me an answer of 1,340. So that is 1,340 grams of H2O. Now, that's just one of our two answers that we need for comparison. Now we're gonna start out with 1,500 grams of O2. So right down below here, I'm gonna have 1,500, 1,500 uh, grams of O2. The first thing that I need to do in my first conversion is I need to go from grams of O2 
to moles. So down below here, I'm going to have grams of O2. Up top, I can't go grams of O2 straight to grams of water. I first have to go to moles of O2. Now, to save you some time here, there in every one mole of O2, there is 32.00 grams of O2. So again, we get 32.00 grams of O2 for every one mole. Once again, we're not in grams of water. So what we have to do here, we set up another conversion. So this time we're gonna have moles of O2 on bottom. To cancel out, uh, we're gonna go this time to H2O. Now the only way we can go from one substance to another is if we have a mole to mole ratio. Now, mole over mole, we turn to the periodic table, or excuse me, we turn to the balanced chemical equation and the coefficients. So the number in front of O2 is one, and the coefficient in front of H2O is two. Now we're not quite done because we need grams of water. So again, we set up this conversion. This time we have moles of H2O on bottom here to cancel out. And then we can finally, just like we did up top here, get to grams of H2O on top. Now, one mole of H2O is still 18.02 grams. So we put one with moles and then we put 18.02 grams with our H2O. So now, once again, I'm gonna multiply everything on top. Divide it by everything multiplied on bottom. And so we start out with this. We start out with 1,500 decimal there, times one, times one, times two, times 18.02. Now, that is just what is on top. Now we divide, and very key thing here, we put a set of parentheses here. We divide, open the parentheses, 32.00, 32.00 times one, times one again. We close the parentheses and we press enter. So, this time right here, uh, we have an answer of 1,689 and some decimals. If we round it to three significant digits, this rounds to 1,690 grams of H2O. So 1,690 grams H2O. Now, just like the last problem, we have to ask ourselves this, okay, which of these two numbers, 1,340, or 1,690 is smaller? Well, the answer here is this, the 1,340. So the smaller number is the maximum amount of water that can be produced. So our answer to our question is this, 1,340 grams of H2O is produced or should be produced and then we have this. Whatever reactant gave us that smaller number, so we go all the way back to over here, this becomes our limiting reactant. So in this case here, our H2 is our limiting reactant, which I'm going to abbreviate it as LR. Now what that means about O2, the other reactant involved in this particular problem, O2 is our excess reactant. So O2 is our excess reactant, or I'm going to abbreviate that as ER. So this is kind of a lengthy process, but if we do it correctly, we knock out how many grams of H2O we can produce, we figure out which is the limiting and which is the excess reactant in these types of problems. Okay, so now that we have this business about limiting and excess reactants in mind, we can transition now uh, to some yields. And so what we have here is some different types of yields, and these all tie back into that business of limiting and excess reactants. So the first thing that we do here is we start out with the term theoretical yield. 
Now, theoretical yield is defined as the amount of product calculated to form when all of the limiting reactant is consumed. Now, actual yield is defined as the amount of product actually obtained in an experiment or in a chemical reaction. And normally the actual yield is less than the theoretical yield. And a couple reasons that normally the actual yield is less than the theoretical yield is the reactants may not fully react. And then also the reactants may react in a different way than is desired. So that brings us down to percent yield. Now the percent yield is defined as a formula that relates the actual yield to the theoretical yield. And remember, the actual yield is the amount of material recovered in a lab experiment. And remember, the actual yield, once again, is the amount of material recovered in a lab experiment. Now, we mentioned that this has a formula. So, with the formula, it makes it really easy to remember this definition. The formula for percent yield, I'm going to use the percent sign, so we have percent yield. That is equal to the actual yield, the actual yield divided by the theoretical yield. This, because it is a percent, after you perform that calculation, you multiply it by 100 to get your percent yield. So we can also we can also tie this together into our business about stoichiometry. So we go out and we try our example here. So it's it's basically what we've been doing with the business of limiting reactants, and now we're going to tie that formula of percent yield into this. So we have adipic acid which you can see the formula there, is used to produce nylon. Um, and it's done between a reaction of cyclohexane and oxygen. So let's assume that you carry out a reaction in a lab with 25.0 grams of cyclohexane and cyclohexane is the limiting reactant in this case we want to know what is the theoretical yield of adipic acid in this case. So it's really nice, unlike the other problems that just said, hey, here is two amounts of the reactants. Good luck, find the answer. This says, hey, cyclohexane is automatically our limiting reactant. So we don't have to worry about the limiting reactant. What we're going to do is we're going to go from grams of cyclohexane to grams of adipic acid. Now, with this, you always start out by the values or the number that is given. So we start out here with 25.0 grams of cyclohexane, which cyclohexane in the formula or in the problem is given as C6H12. Now, eventually, we're going to have to get to grams of adipic acid, but we can't do there in one single step we first must go from grams of adipic or excuse me grams of cyclohexane to moles so on bottom here we're going to have grams because grams need to cancel out diagonal and it's going to be c6h12 now on top we can have the unit of moles of c6h12 we have to convert to moles of that substance first what we do here, I save some time here because one mole, one mole of C6H12 equals a molar mass of 84.16 grams. So again, we have our molar mass here. The 84 number is associated with grams. So we have 84.16 grams for every one mole. And so now we're in moles of cyclohexane. So what we need to do now, we need to cancel out 
we need to cancel out our moles of cyclohexane. So we have diagonal moles of C6H12. And now we can go to our other substance, which we're trying to get adipic acid there. So we can go to H2C6H8O4, but we have to do it in moles. So I kind of squeeze that in there, but that is moles of adipic acid. Now, everyone see, we have mole over mole. What we do to find out or place those numbers is we turn to the balanced chemical equation. The coefficient number, in this case in front of C6H12 is two. That means we have a coefficient number of two. In front of adipic acid, we have a coefficient of two. So again, we have a value of two. Now, we're not in grams, so that means we have to do one more step with this particular problem. So on bottom here, we are going to have, we are going to have moles, moles of C6, oh, excuse me, sorry about that, H2, H2C6H8, O4. And I know I kind of squeezed that in, but that is adipic acid. And on top, we are going to have grams of adipic acid. Now, again, this is gram over mole, so it would be the molar mass. And to save a little time here, I have one mole of H2C6H8O4 equal equal to 146.14 grams. So one is associated with moles. This 146.14 is our molar mass, a so 146.14. And now we can calculate out the theoretical yield. So what we are going to do here is this. I'm gonna multiply everything on top and then divide it by everything multiplied together on bottom. So I start out here with 25.0. So 25.0 times one times two times 146.14. So times 146.14. We press enter. Now that's just the top business, so we need to divide it by everything multiplied together on bottom. So we hit divide. Parentheses is key here. So we have 84.16 84 times two times one. We close the parentheses, we press enter. Now, we had three significant digits. So that means when we have this answer here, we had 43.4 grams of adipic acid in our theoretical yield. So. What we have here, again, is 43.4 grams of adipic acid, H2C6H8O4. And that right there, that is our theo, theoretical yield. So if everything went 100% perfect in the lab, you should obtain 43.4 grams of adipic acid. Now, I'll tell you this is an organic reaction, and so getting the actual theoretical yield or actually even getting somewhere close is relatively rare. You have to be pretty experienced uh, in the lab to obtain that. So let's say here you run the reaction and you only get 33.5 grams of adipic acid. Well, we want to know what is the percent yield. So as a reminder, just from the last, last page of notes, the percent yield is equal to the actual yield. So the actual yield is on top divided by the theoretical yield and all of this business, because it's a percent, is then multiplied by 100. So let's go ahead, let's plug our numbers in that we have here. So we have the percent yield 
we have the percent yield equal the actual yield, which the actual yield is given. That's the value you obtained in a lab experiment. So that actual yield here is 33.5 grams divided by what the theoretical yield should be, which is 43.4 grams. So we have 43.4 grams. And now all of this is multiplied by 100. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to put 33.5 divided by 43.4, press enter, and then multiply that by 100. So 33.5 divided by 43.4, enter, I press uh, multiply by 100, and I get my percent yield. Now I had three significant digits in that calculation, so this percent yield in this particular reaction is 77.2%. So again, the percent yield, the percent yield in this particular example is 77.2% percent. So we circle that answer and that is how we have our theoretical yield. Now we can go uh, into a little bit more detail and we can get uh, into more depth about this but this is the simplified process for this type of uh, problems. Now what I want to get into is talking about empirical and molecular formulas. So we'll, we'll shift gears here a little bit and we will kind of transition to a newer topic, but it's relatable to what we, we just talked about. Okay, so empirical formulas, what they do is they give us the relative number of atoms of each element in a particular molecule. Now for empirical formulas, the ratio of the numbers of moles of all elements in a compound gives the subscript in the compound's empirical formula. And now this ratio can be calculated as or from percent composition data. And now for this class, the percent composition data is always going to be given to you. It's not going to be expected to know. Uh, but if you were to go advance in chemistry, uh, they have uh, mass spectrometers, usually gas chromatography mass spectrometers, that actually get that data. So it's actually cool to work with those, those machines uh, to be able to see the percent composition of whatever molecule or solution you're working with. Anyways, uh, we move down to the steps, how we can get to the calculation of the empirical formula. So the first step is change the percent composition to grams of each element. Now, the reason that we can do step one here is that we assume we are working with a 100 gram sample, uh, and that's why we can make that first step. Now, the second step is to convert grams to moles of each element. Now remember, each element has its own unique atomic mass or molar mass that is found on the periodic table. So this will be a little bit different for each element involved in this process. Now the third step is to divide by the smallest number of moles from step two. Now that's everything is getting divided by that smallest number. So everything will get divided by uh, that particular smallest number of moles. And then the fourth and final step is multiply each of the moles until a whole numbers are reached. And this fourth step is a, a lot like algebra where if you multiply one thing you need to multiply everything. And that will be seen here in our example. So let's go ahead let's try this out into our examples. So we're going to try to find the empirical formula here of azorbic acid. And it, they, they run it through a GCMS or gas chromatography mass spec. And that device finds the percent composition to be 40.92% carbon, 4.58% hydrogen, and 54.50% oxygen by mass. We want to know ultimately what is the empirical formula 
of ascorbic acid. So all we do here is this. I'm gonna rewrite the percentages of each of the elements. So we're gonna have 40.92% carbon. I'm gonna leave a little space. We have 4.58% hydrogen. And then I'm gonna leave a little more space and then we have 54 0.50% oxygen. Now, all we do, the first step is we take the percent, and instead of having the percent sign, we have the grams, or G for gram sign. So all I do here, instead of 40.92%, I have 40.92 grams of carbon. For hydrogen, I have 4.58 grams of hydrogen and for oxygen I have 54.50 grams of oxygen. Now I have my grams I need to get moles of each of these elements and remember the molar mass for each element is going to be a little bit different. So I'm going to go one at a time here I'm going to start with carbon. Remember to get it into moles you cancel the same unit diagonal, so I'll have grams of carbon on top, and I can go straight from grams of carbon to moles of carbon. And the way I find the number associated with G for grams is I look up carbon, and now carbon has a molar mass of 12.01, so the molar mass here would be 12.01 grams for every one mole. So what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna take 40.92 and I'm gonna divide it by 12.01. So 40.92 divided by 12.01. I press enter and I am going to keep a total of four digits. So in this calculation here, I have 3.407 moles of carbon. So 3.407 seven moles of carbon. Now, I do the same thing for hydrogen, but remember, hydrogen is going to have a different molar mass. So again, if we look this up on the periodic table, we find hydrogen to have a molar mass of 1.008. Now, remember, hydrogen is my only element that I like to have three decimal places just my nature or creature of habit here. So in my calculator, I'm gonna put 4.58 divided by 1.008. So 4.58 divided by 1.008. And this gets me the number of moles. So I'm gonna have 4.544 moles of hydrogen. Now, we do the same thing for oxygen. So, oxygen, we put grams of O on bottom, and then on top, we put moles of O. We look up, oxygen has a molar mass of 16.00 grams per one mole. So we have 16.00 grams for one mole. Now, what I'm gonna do is to take 54.50, divided by 16. So 54.50 divided by 16.00. And I get 3.406. So I get 3.406 moles of O. Now what I do here is this. I look at which one of these numbers is the smallest. Well, the smallest is 3.406. So each of these moles, and this is kind of a weird step, but each of these moles needs to get divided by the smallest number. So I'm gonna divide everything by 3.406, and hopefully you can see 3.406 divided by 3.406 is going to get us one. I'm just gonna leave that as my number, and I'm gonna go to my next value here. So I'm gonna put in my calculator 
0.44 divided by 3.406. So again, in my calculator, I'm going to put 4.544 divided by 3.406. And I get a value, I'm only going to use two digits, and I'll, I'll tell you why here in a second, of 1.33. Again, I'm just going to put the number because we're going to have to do a little bit more work here. And then what I do is the same thing. I take 3.407 divided by my smallest number of moles, which was 3.046. And I'm going to show you in the calculator what we need to do. So 3.407 divided by 3.406, press enter, and look how close that is to zero. So if you're this close to a whole number, you can just leave it as a whole number. So what I'm going to do here is I'm just going to have one as my whole number. Now I have to multiply till whole, that was the step four there. And so what I need to think of is this. Right here, my hydrogen is, is my, my problem. And I need to think, okay, what could I multiply 1.33 by to get something close to a whole digit? Well, 0.33, if I multiply that by two, I'm not gonna get anywhere close, but what if I multiply this by three? So what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna multiply 1.33 by three. I'm just gonna see what happens here. So 1.33 times three, and look at that. Hey, that is really, really close to four. I'm gonna call that four, and it's okay to round a little bit here. And so this right here means we need four moles of H in our empirical formula. Now, just like in algebra, just because you did it to one thing that means you have to do it to everything else. So we multiply everything else by three. So this means we need three moles of hydrogen. And then we multiply our oxygen by three. And so this means we need three moles of oxygen. Now, this is really important, the last set of moles that I wrote down, because when we go to have our empirical formula, what we are going to do, what we are going to do is this. We are gonna start out with the first element listed. Again, make it easy on yourself and write it down carbon. Now the subscript for carbon is going to be, oop, and I made a mistake here, is going to be three. And that's after the multiplication and things of that nature, so we'd get C3. We write down the next element in line here, which is hydrogen. And the subscript is that whole number that we found, which is four. And then our last element is oxygen, so we have O. And so the value there is going to be three for our subscript. That becomes our empirical formula. So again, you kind of have to do a little bit of rounding. If you're in the ballpark of a whole number, it's okay to, to round up or down a little bit, but don't get too crazy, don't get too excessive with that rounding. All right, so we have one more major thing here with this section to talk about, and that is going from empirical formula to molecular formula. So with this, with this, we have to think about what a uh, molecular formula is. A molecular formula is the actual ratio of elements in a particular formula, meaning that, hey, it can't be simplified. So empirical is the simplest portion of the particular compound. A molecular, the subscripts could be simplified. Anyways, let's move on to the steps here. So step number one is calculate the molar mass of the empirical formula. Step number two is to divide the molecular weight by the molar mass of the empirical formula. And that molecular weight is gonna be given in the problem. And then what you need to do, the final step, step three, is multiply the ratio found in the above step, step two, by all the subscripts in the empirical formula. So let's go ahead, let's put these steps to the test in a particular example. 
So we have a hydrocarbon that has an empirical formula of C3H4. And in an experiment, the molecular weight was found to be 121 atomic mass units. We want to know what is the molecular formula. So the first thing that we need to do is we need to obtain the molar mass of that empirical formula. So for C3H4, a carbon is going to have a molar mass of 12.01 AMUs. We multiply it by how many carbons we have, which is three. So in this example here, all I'm gonna do is take 12.01 times three, and I get 36.03 AMUs. So 30, whoop, put my decimal a little early. 30, 36.03 AMUs. And then my hydrogen here, my only other element that's involved has a molar mass of 1.008 AMUs, and we multiply that by our number of hydrogens, which is four. And so all I'm gonna do is punch in in my calculator, 1.008 times four, press enter, and we have a value of 4.03 AMUs. We add those together, so 36.03, 36.03 plus uh, 4.03, and we get a value of 40.06. So now what we do here is this. We need to determine the ratio here of what was experimentally found divided by our empirical formula. So I'm just gonna call this the ratio. So on top, on top, you always put the molecular weight, the molecular weight of what was given, which was 120 AMUs. On bottom, you put the empirical molar mass, which is 40.06 AMUs. Now, what we're gonna do here is take 121 divided by 40.06. So we have 121 divided by 40.06, you press enter, and we're gonna to round to the, the nearest whole number, and it's pretty close to whole number, and we get a value of three. So, we get a value of three. Now this is really important, because in step three here, it says multiply this ratio, which is three, by all of the uh, subscripts in our empirical formula. So if you wanna think about it mathematically here, I'm gonna put C3H4 in parentheses, and then all of that needs to be multiplied by three. And what we mean, or what I mean by multiply it by three is those subscripts. So the molecular formula, the molecular formula of this particular, um, compound or the molecular compound is gonna be C9 because three times three and then H12 when we multiply that by, by three. Okay, so one thing that I was thinking while I was doing these notes was this. In the limiting reactant problems, we can go one step further. So before we end today here, I added just a little bit more and I just wanted to make sure that you had a full comprehensive understanding of limiting reactants. So what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna go back to our limiting reactant problem that we had between hydrogen and oxygen. And that's this one right here. So what I wanted to do is this. After this reaction happened, and we determine H2 is the limiting reactant, which means that all of that is consumed, and oxygen is the excess reactant, I wanted to go one step further, and I should have put this in here, but I wanted to know, okay, well, if oxygen is excess, how much oxygen remains? So I'm gonna leave this uh, just at the top of the screen here, and we're gonna reference it but I have a little extensive, extended question here. And so I wanna know how much oxygen remains after the reaction is complete. 
So what you need to do is you need to do this. Uh, the first step in this whole process, step number one, is to convert convert the limiting reactant, LR, to the excess reactant in grams. I'm going to put that in parentheses, in grams. And then what you're going to do, you're going to get a value, which should be lower than your starting amount. The second step in this process is you are going to subtract the starting, the starting amount of excess reactant. Oop, and that should say subtract. Subtract the starting amount of excess reactant. from step one above. Okay, so let's go through this process here. We said, we said, I'm gonna pull this back in here. We said that hydrogen is our limiting reactant. So what we need to do is we need to convert the limiting reactant to the excess reactant. So what we're gonna start out with is 150 grams of hydrogen, and we're eventually going to convert this to grams of oxygen. So, we convert first to moles of hydrogen, so we have moles of H2. Remember, if you remember from the top here, there were 2.02 grams for every, for every one mole of H2. Now that we're in moles of H2, we're gonna cancel that unit, and since we're in moles of O2, we can go from we can go from moles of one substance to moles of another. And so we want to go to O2. And so I'm going to pull the chemical reaction back down, or at least the balanced chemical equation. Remember, mole to mole ratio, we utilize the balanced chemical equation or the coefficients to be able to put those values in our problem. So for hydrogen, we have a coefficient of two. And for oxygen, we have a coefficient of one. Now, doesn't really help us out because we had grams of oxygen given, so we need to do one more step here. And so we're gonna cancel out moles of O2 on bottom and go to grams of O2 on top. Now, again, one mole of oxygen had 32.00 grams in that one mole. So we get 32.00. And so what this is, what this is, is gonna be the amount of oxygen actually consumed in our reaction. So we go through this process here. I'm gonna take 150 decimal point there, multiply it by one, by one again, and by 32.00. So by one, multiply it by one, multiply it by 32.00. Now I press enter, that is only my top business, my top stuff, I need to divide it by everything on bottom. So I'm gonna divide it by parentheses, very, very key, 2.02 .02 times two times one, close the parentheses, and I get this. Now I add three significant digits, so I'm gonna round this to 1,190, and this is going to be 1,000, 1,190 grams of O2 that is consumed. So it's actually used up in the reaction. And then to find out how much excess oxygen remains, what we do is we utilize the starting amount of oxygen, which was given in the problem as 1,500 grams. So we, we say 1,500, 1,500 uh, grams of O2 and we subtract that we subtract that from the amount of oxygen actually consumed so we actually use 1190 grams of O2 now we just performed this calculation real simple calculation in our calculator and so I take 1500 and I subtract that by 1,190, 
and I press enter. So 310, 310 grams, 310 grams of oxygen, O2, is in excess. Okay, so after the, the reaction completes or stops, there is still 310 grams of oxygen that remain as a reactant. And that's because it did not get reacted. So I know this is a little extension and a little out of order, and I, I did not have that in notes, but it's really, really good to know. Okay, I find my limiting in excess. I find out how much product can be obtained. Now I need to know, okay, well, how much excess reactant actually remains? Okay, so I know this has been a little lengthy of an episode. There's a lot going on, a lot involved with stoichiometry, with the limiting reactant business. Uh, it's a really good core part of chemistry, and it's really essential for your success here. So, uh, as always, I hope you have enjoyed this video, and remember to subscribe.